Welcome back to Retro Rebound. In today's video, we are veering toward the light because, as we all know, Kingdom Hearts is light. The Gel Blaster is the gift for the holiday season. No exaggeration. Ladies and gentlemen, this toy was such a throwback to use and it's a perfect fit for this channel because the Gel Blaster is going to change the way that you play. And we're going to talk a lot about the Surge XL because this toy blasts water-based gelats. So you can fill up, for example, a bucket of water, pour your own gelats into there, and then grow your own ammo effectively, which hydrates rates over the course of a couple of hours or the surge xl will come with its own already hydrated gelats that you can load into the actual blaster itself but it is kitted out you get a stock for it you can even change the firing modes to three burst for example and yes since this gelat does not stain leave residue or a mess it's all natural you can see me just firing away here having an absolute blast in the indoors so this is a genuinely great toy it's the perfect oh time to get into it for the holiday season pick it up for maybe a little brother a little sister and right now you can get 10 percent off the gel blaster surge xl click the link in the description down below to shop now indeed we are talking about kingdom hearts in the year 2022 i have not played this since it came out on the HD Remix 1.5 all those years ago when I was in college and oh my God, it feels like a millennium ago. And now today I'm here to talk about Kingdom Hearts in 2022. Is it worth diving back into? You see, I was asking myself this very same question. The reason is I played Kingdom Hearts 3. It was an emotional experience because I couldn't believe the game existed. But as I got further from it and I thought about the bane of my existence known as dream drop distance i really couldn't stand where the story had gone and i had friends from all sides urging me go back to the original let's hone our focus and remember why we love this series and for those who don't know kingdom Hearts 2 is one of my favorite video games of all time easily in my top 10 probably in my top five a childhood classic unlike anything else with some of the best action combat i've seen in a jrpg and you know what? I don't like that I started to kind of diss on Kingdom Hearts. So do I still love it? Was the real question I was going into this series considering. And I discovered some of that love, but it also solidified some of my feelings. So this is going to be an interesting video with some fun stories. If you're new here, you're into retrospectives, nostalgic content, especially on those Square Enix games. Consider subscribing with that the two-part complete in box experience so we have ps2 the original release but really quickly i'm going to do this one here so this is the kingdom hearts 2.5 hd remix steelbook and the one thing i have a problem with when it comes to these steelbooks is they put this on the top and it ruins what is otherwise excellent art by tetsuya nomura now the reason we have 2.5 which is originally the version that came with i believe it was kingdom hearts 2 recoded and birth by sleep is because the collector's edition that i bought came with a second disc that was, you guessed it, 1.5. So me being the idiot I was, traded in 1.5 because I needed money, and that was that. So we have the manual for 2.5 here. It's just a quick booklet you crack open, and 1.5 as well. So it's technically a two-for-one complete box copy, and it allowed me to consolidate my collection as a kid, but I admittedly regret that a little bit. So that's the more modern one when it came out on PS3, a HD remaster that Square Enix always died by saying it can never happen. It can't go to any other systems. Now it's on Switch. It's on Xbox. Yeah. Okay. They just didn't want to. But as for the original complete box experience, we got to talk about Kingdom Hearts box art. Beautiful. Look at that. So nice. Even the back of the box here with Sora looking up to the light. You love to see it. It says explore new and familiar worlds featuring over 100 Disney characters. Beware of the Disney villains and their devious intentions. Team up with Disney heroes as you battle evil. And you can see Peter Pan here. You can see this is in the Olympus Coliseum. And then it says experience stunning graphics and authentic voiceovers, which indeed I will say both of those are true. Now inside we have, I mean, this is when, mind you, Square Soft. This is not Square Enix, which you will see on their future boxes. This was towards the end of the Square Soft era. So this logo holds a lot of meaning to people, and I believe this game retains that Squaresoft DNA. Now, the actual manual itself is nothing short of what you'd expect from a Square Enix manual, or Squaresoft, sorry, but uh, it is colorful, it is beautiful with 
Character bios a plenty. Sora's 14, Kyrie 14, Riku 15 a year older. Goofy, captain of the Royal Knights. Donald Duck is the court wizard and loyal servant to the king. They go over the Heartless. Of course, everything about the game and how you play it, the environment, how save points work, how they replenish your health, what you're going to look for when you're exploring. I will talk about exploration a lot in this game because I found it quite refreshing. The summoning spells and how they interact with your magic bar, the actual magic itself, the abilities that you'll learn and how you equip them with the AP system, equipment, items. We can see Halloween Town here in the background. You love that kind of homage. And yeah, just a little nod to all the Disney places that you go in the background of every single one. I think this one here is the Ep Olympus Coliseum with the going ship stuff. Oh boy. We'll talk about that theme song. They have the lyrics for Simple and Clean here. So if you ever want to sing along, which is a thing, uh, you can go ahead and do so. Certainly I'm going to do that. And then there are the credits. And then towards the back here are figures that you could collect for Kingdom Hearts. The strategy guide, of course, Disney promotion, and then some beautiful art here, especially this one here. I absolutely love. And then the actual uh, marketing slip that you could send to companies to give your feedback. And then here, oh, what a great shot. So yeah, just a very art-driven game, an art-driven series, so many emotions going into it. It's a series that undoubtedly, I think, will make you feel something, but did I love it as much as when I was a kid, going back to it now as a young adult who still loves Kingdom Hearts, but just can't friggin' get over all the storytelling woes? Let's discuss. Story time. So your man played Kingdom Hearts 2 first as a kid. And I don't regret that at all because I started off with peak fiction, literally. Like all the Disney stuff was here, the returning to the worlds, the overall combat, like it's all there. So no regrets for me starting at the second point in the series. What I will say though, is I remember when my mom knew I loved Kingdom Hearts, she went and bought me Kingdom Hearts 1 because I didn't have that. I only had the second game. And I remember trying it out and going, huh, this isn't as good as the second one, is it? Mm. I played it and beat it anyway, because number one, it was a wonderful gift, a thoughtful gift of that, and I'm appreciative of thoughtful gifts. But also, it was just one of those things where, you know, when you're a kid, you barely get games. So when you do get one, it's like, yeah, I'm going to go through this whole thing here. So Kingdom Hearts 1, one of my major stopping points, I call it playthrough killers, and uh, there are a few in this series. One of them is destiny islands to me for some i understand why this is nostalgic because look i'm someone who when i talk about star wars knights of the Old republic 2 i tell you all to play paragus mining facility and that's the mod that outright skips it because people just are sick of it at this point in time so i get that destiny islands has some appeal to people but for me that tutorial the seeking of the coconuts and the sticks and the mushrooms and all this stuff is so drawn out and it is a game that's shorter than typical jrpgs this one took me 17 hours so that one hour is all the more crucial long term because it's like wow they really chomped up a good chunk of the game here on something that i thought was kind of just meandering a bit to get to the next point what i do love are a lot of the seeds that are planted here and that's something i appreciated as i went along kingdom hearts again is i recognize okay there was a plan at some point for this story and it wasn't so absurdly complex which i love a good complex story but it wasn't so absurdly complex that you've sort of lost the plot in the heart of all that pardon the pun so while i had some issues with destiny island i did like certain surprises there that i wasn't familiar with when i was a kid or even when i played it back in college like seeing final fantasy 10 characters titus waka are there hanging out and i'm like okay this as a Final Fantasy fan is now telling me that where I am right now in Destiny Islands might not like be a type of reality because like why are these characters here when we know where they were I mean it's awfully fitting but the Final Fantasy nods were so sorely missed in Kingdom Hearts 3 and just Final Fantasy presence in general I was like man man this is so nice I love that so Destiny Islands, I, I teetered back and forth. Riku beat the life out of me here. I could not beat him to save my life. And I lost over and over and over and over. But after a long, I thought, drawn out island sequence, you get to Traverse Town. And I really like this place, man. I love the vibe of it. The kind of somber nature that people who have lost their homes are all brought here. And this becomes all the more somber when you learn that if you are to restore all of these planets that have lost themselves in the darkness that 
everyone's going to return there. And it's almost like, what does Traverse Town even okay. exist for? A wonderful plot point that I don't think was carried on quite enough, but something that did grab me and invest me more in the current plot structure. Like, okay, the stakes are higher because I like that I'm here. I like how everyone's together because you want to be with your friends, but eventually you all got to go apart. And it's almost for the greater good anyway. So I like when Kingdom Hearts manages to intelligently pull at those heartstrings. And I think Traverse Town is at the heartbeat of that. I'm using a lot of heart puns here. I'm sorry. It's going to be all video because that's just how I speak, I've realized now. But what this place also started to put the thought in my head is, oh my God, I'm getting lost. I'm getting lost again. And how finding your next objective in Kingdom Hearts 1, if you're not like super nostalgic and have that encyclopedic memory of where everything is at certain points in the game, you're going to get lost and, and ranging all the way into Hollow Bastion where that place is laid out like a maze and you have to trek back and forth through that multiple times. I'm not asking for, you know, waypoints and quest markers, but a little bit of assistance on where to go as the camera's flipping all over the place would have been nice to have because it all began in Traverse Town. But continuing on from there, you know, you get your real Final Fantasy fix in, you fight Squall from Final Fantasy VIII. I'm like, okay, like I'm about to hop into that this year. Okay, nice. Like, I love seeing him here because I'm keen to learn more about his backstory. And now that I've seen him, I was how edgy and detached he is. Like, I'm about this lifestyle, right? I'm about seeing how these Final Fantasy characters interact in the Kingdom Hearts universe because something I recognized is, of course, because Kingdom Hearts 1 is when everyone's so young, the character model style was reminiscent of, say, Final Fantasy IX, which is the last of its kind, right? This small, almost chibi, polygonal style of art, and everyone's phases are, like, rounded in a particular way in the Final Fantasy world within Kingdom Hearts, and I just love how, I think, accidentally, these character models call back to that, and because they're small and they have like bigger limbs, it just appears that way to me. So I appreciate that almost unintentional classical callback. As I ventured from planet to planet, this is going to sound really weird, but what I loved was the attention to detail in Kingdom Hearts 1. This was something like the footsteps changing depending on what surface you were on versus what surface you were on with your keyblade on your shoulder. If you listen, you'll hear a little jingle of the keychain from the keyblade jingling around as you're running. And to me, it's those small feats that sort of define a game as going beyond just existing because Square Enix easily could have leaned into the Disney properties here and let them do all of the heavy carrying. But when you start to think on that level as a creative, what it communicates to me as a player is you're thinking about everything down to the finest detail possible, which is footsteps versus footsteps with Keyblade out. It's a small thing, and it's a thing that most people won't notice, but as someone who recognized it, I appreciated that level of effort because there are more forward-facing levels of effort, like simple and clean, the opening. It's like, oh, this is incredible. There's so many emotions here. The combat and its fluidity, its animation, it's excellent. You know, there are a lot of forward-facing things, but the things that lie underneath the radar, if you will, are the ones that really call my love because it's like, okay, I see how much you're really trying with this. It's not always going to define a product, but when I already like something, it'll like, it'll make me like it even more. And so that's what Kingdom Hearts 1 did. And as I went from all these Disney planets, you know, Agrabah, Halloween Town, Olympus Coliseum, I was reminded of how nice it is to have Disney bosses. And I know that's an age old complaint when it comes to Kingdom Hearts 3. And I know a lot of it was out of Square's hands because of how Disney was operating at the time, but it definitely delivered a killing blow. Like the feeling of fighting in the Pirates of the Caribbean world where you actually fought a, put this in quotes, Disney boss versus going to Toy Story and fighting a giant Heartless at the end. It's night and day. And when you're going into Kingdom Hearts 1 and you're fighting Ursula or Jafar and so on and so forth there is a feeling there of like yes this is the connection I'm looking for like these evil villains are people I'm fighting and they have cool boss kits and ways to tackle them don't get me started on Ursula though Atlantica in general just like what was the idea behind Atlantica where they said oh okay so we're gonna like strip away all of your movement we're gonna put this jingle in the background that lasts way too long. We're gonna make it one of the longest plans in the game. And we're gonna put this cauldron obscure boss fight with Ursula 
where she's going to repeat the ha 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 line over and over and over. We're going to combine all these infuriating elements into one and poof, there's Atlantica. There's your favorite planet in the game, right, gamer? Oh, Lord. But to my point, those Disney bosses were so refreshing to encounter because then you'd get these diverse enemy types beneath them and it would kind of call attention to them, like the way certain Heartless would change based off the geography they're in, based off the Disney world you were in. Like if you're in deep jungle, another place I got lost in a lot, you saw that they were more jungle themed Heartless versus when you were in Aladdin where they were dressed differently there. So I just really appreciated again, that level of detail, but it all comes back to that Disney focus. When Kingdom Hearts is focused more on Disney with Sora being its driving force character, it is incredibly refreshing. And speaking of which, one of the biggest flaws of newer Kingdom Hearts games is that Sora's kind of dumb. And I don't like that. I don't love Kingdom Hearts 1 Sora. Kingdom Hearts 2 Sora is my Sora. But Kingdom Hearts 1 Sora is compelling because he's kind of discovering himself through this kid-like journey that you maybe dream out about a little bit like as you're growing up you you have those dreams at least i did i played mini golf with scooby-doo and shaggy one time you have these dreams of going on these adventures with these characters and kingdom Hearts sort of embodies that but as he goes on this journey he discovers himself i kind of liked how him and donald didn't like each other at first and then by the end of the game donald's the one crying out to sora as he disappears because he brings back Kyrie. it's like wow you know that is actual true character development but Sora's sacrifice for his friends and his love for his friends doesn't feel like an overplayed theme as it does in modern Kingdom Hearts games. It's like that discovery of what Kingdom Hearts is, what light is, what darkness is, and the reason it all exists is something that's so more wildly compelling than what is presented in newer games. Because here it's like, Ansem the Wise was investigating the darkness of the hearts and his lab was actually Hollow Bastion. So it feels like it's connected there. And then Sora is the Keyblade wielder, and he can open up the door to the light. I mean, it's there's still a lot of confusing elements to it, and I couldn't begin to try to tell you everything about this game from point A to point Z, but it was a lot easier to follow. Like the idea that Maleficent was rounding up all of the Disney princesses and to use their hearts to unlock Kingdom Hearts. I mean, you needed Kyrie's heart, and so to get Kyrie's heart, you needed Sora. It all interconnected by the end in a way that you can't get in a modern Kingdom Hearts game up to three because three spent so much time trying to untangle the mess. And I think they did a pretty good job of it, but they spent so long trying to untangle messy aspects of the story in three that they couldn't tell their own. It had what I like to call the Rise of Skywalker effect, where Rise of Skywalker had to spend more time untangling what they viewed as a mess in The Last Jedi than just continuing the story. And when you're put in that hole, like pretty much one foot in the grave, your story's already done. And that's kind of where Kingdom Hearts 3 was. There was still a lot of heartfelt moments, especially that like five hour stretch finale was just, oh my God, worth it. But I don't want to turn this into a Kingdom Hearts 3 disc fest. It's just when you had this type of retrospective, you have to look at three versus one. And I was reminded that, wow, the gummy ship has been in this series pretty much since the beginning. And hey, is there anyone out there, be honest with me, is there anyone truly out there that goes like, man, you know, I love the gummy ship in Kingdom Hearts. Like that's my favorite part of the game, but it's there every time. And I don't know if it's like, I was talking about it with a friend. I don't know if it's like Final Fantasy where they have to give you that ship moment. Like the game begins when it ends moment is what I call it, where here's your ship. The game's not over like you thought it was. You're actually able to explore this whole open world now that previously we explored in, in segments. No, like, here's your gummy ship, and now you can explore the whole galaxy. And they put these shoot 'em up games in it. Just like, man, just take me to the next planet. I know they're short-lived, but take me to the next planet. I didn't customize. I don't mess with anything in the gummy ship. Like, there's a reason why I've never got a Kingdom Hearts Platinum Trophy, and it's literally because of the gummy ship. Because I just don't find this part of the game compelling at all. Even when I was a kid, it was just, okay, here we go. And Kingdom Hearts 3 even dares to continue it on. Although Kingdom Hearts 3 did it the best. It's still like, why is this a component of the series? I wonder if it's like settlement building in Fallout though. Because for a lot of people, they go, why is settlement building even in this series? I don't want it here. I want more RPG elements. While there are many people who only play Fallout to build settlements. 
So I wonder if that's the same thing with Kingdom Hearts. Like, are there people who truly, I don't mean to sound patronizing, but do they truly sit there and go like, yeah, man, the gummy ship, rock on, here we go. Because I certainly have never experienced one fraction of that feeling in my lifetime. And I don't think I ever will. I think the game would be better, like addition by subtraction if they got rid of it. But at a certain point, you're looking at a game that, I mean, if you skip all the cutscenes, you could beat this game really fast. But if you were looking at this game with no gummy ship segments and skipping cutscenes, you can breeze through this thing in like five hours, probably. It is a short, short, short game, especially if you know where to go to. I mean, it's a tight game. And that's what I like about its compartmentalized nature. Well, the environments are so frustrating to explore in the likes of Deep Jungle, Hollow Bastion, etc. It's really easy to get lost. There are certain locations that really lend themselves well to Kingdom Hearts, like Halloween Town was built for Kingdom Hearts. The way the Heartless transformed, the way that they were using the Heartless to kind of Frankenstein this really creepy monstrosity for Halloween. Her Perfection, down to Oogie Boogie's boss fight in the multiple stages. This is, to me, hands down the best planet that game had to offer. It was so much fun going back to it. It gives you Pumpkin Head, the best Keyblade in the game. But that touches on another aspect, because I never got the Divine Rose Keyblade that I used by the end of the game. This was awesome to unlock because a friend had guided me there, because this game has underrated exploration. I don't know if it's the best in the series because quite frankly, I'm too far removed from everything in it right now to say so decisively. But between the Trinity points, the chess, the rate of unlocks between high jump, glide, super fast glide, the way you get all these things and then can retroactively return to these places and unlock new things, get new items to synthesize new uh, materials. I really liked that about this game. I think there is something oddly compelling about it because it's not too broad where it's overwhelming, but yeah, even making something like the Ultima Keyblade, which, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I've never done before. Uh, it, it is overwhelming, but it feels like manageable in this game, but it even goes down to like the Olympus Coliseum where you go back to that and there are enemies that you faced later in the game that are now back in these cups. The Phil Cup, the Pegasus Cup, the Hercules Cup, the Platinum Match against Sephiroth. Oh my god. Yeah, so there's a lot of great stuff that you can find by returning to old places. And the game will constantly encourage you. Like Chip and Dale's only line in the game is, we should go back and check out some other planets. There's another cup going on in the Olympus Coliseum. Just constantly reminding you of that. So it is a really good time in that regard. And in conclusion... What I will say is that final boss, I know a lot of people really like it, but to me, it was that let go moment. And I think that's what signified to me that some of the love of this series may have gone away for me because I don't know if I would have typically felt that way, but Kingdom Hearts 1's final boss has like a million and one gauntlets. And that's really for every single world in the game. Every single world just has endless spawning enemies and it can become a lot where Action combat should not feel frustrating, especially when it can feel as good as Kingdom Hearts 1, where the range is slimmed down, the camera's a little bit close, but overall, it still feels decent to play, but it should not be tedious to the point where it's like, oh, another monster closet, and another one, and another one, and they just endlessly keep pouring it on, because especially in Hollow Bastion, like, I couldn't progress in certain areas unless I killed all the Heartless, because you couldn't interact with certain elevators to move on, and when you're going back and forth, or you're getting lost, and they keep spawning, Oh my, oh my, it can be frustrating. So when you combine that level of frustration with the exploration being great, but sometimes getting lost, and then you get to this final boss that is awesome, but it's like at least eight stages long. Before that was a heartless gauntlet with endless enemies in there, it felt like. And imagine doing that on Proud. I was like, dude, this is feeling so stretched out. But through that stretched out nature, I discovered new things about it. So I found myself conflicted. Look, I'm a traditionalist in Kingdom Hearts. And by that, I mean, I grew up using your Cure, Fire, and Blizzard. Because those are the things that just get upgraded first. Fire is good for range. Blizzard was really good in the early going. Cure, you just need to have, in my opinion. And what I really liked was using stop, using gravity, and pulling down flying creatures and weakening them. That was satisfying, using arrow to have these kind of utility spells that prevented damage. Nice. I, I typically don't play Kingdom Hearts that way. I always tell people, I kind of play Kingdom Hearts like an idiot. I, I don't say that with any shame. Like I play it as a fun action game with pretty subtle depth to it. 
and not much else. But as I was forced to pull back the layers, I was like, maybe this could be more to me. Maybe it could be. And I hope to invest myself more in that aspect by Kingdom Hearts 2. But to my original point of all of this was Kingdom Hearts 1's final boss, I felt was a little stretched out, like enough of these phases. And by the time you get to the final phase, it doesn't even feel like a final phase at all to me. It's like, oh, I thought this was just another part of this creature I was taking down. Like, why didn't we just do that last part where you're fighting this giant anthem? That felt like the moment. And I like the thematic aspect, like saving Goofy from the darkness, saving Donald from the darkness, taking them on together. But once you get them all together, there wasn't that last push, like to elevate everyone together. So ultimately rounding out the game, you see Mickey for the first time. Apparently Mickey was only there uh, in that one part because you know, Disney was a little hesitant to give Square Enix the full reign to having their mascot all over the game. And I kind of like that touch there because that limitation made it kind of innovative where when he does show up, you're like, hey, there he is. And you see Riku on the other side, now in the realm of darkness, Sora on the other side, and then you lead it into Rechain of Memories, which is a game that I only played one half of and quite frankly was not crazy about. So returning to Kingdom Hearts was a really fun experience in a number of ways. It was fun because I got to reconnect with the story that I did love growing up. And I got to reconnect with the Disney aspect I did love growing up and remember what that means. But I was reminded of tedious exploration that was rewarding at the same time. I was reminded of a, a at times, God awful camera. I was reminded of some stretched out segments of the game. I was reminded of some weaker platforming. There was a lot of weakness to this game. And I gotta say again, um, Kingdom Hearts 2 stays goaded, but I will see if that holds up as I dive back in because I'm curious now how I feel about this whole series. But that's how I feel about playing Kingdom Hearts 1 in 2022. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm looking forward to seeing your thoughts down below. So please do fire away. With that, take great care of yourselves and I will see you in the next Retro Rebound. Peace out.